thank you everyone for attending. Tonight we are joined by three leaders in their respective fields, Rachel Schneider, Carmen Rojas, and Tamara K. Knopper. Uh, these women, these three women will be discussing and debating the entrenched income volatility faced by workers in the U.S., the responses to this challenge, and what this says about our existing social structures that support work and employment. Um, just to give a little frame in, often the conversation about work and income instability doesn't include the role of financial institutions. The equation for a good job often includes fair pay, health benefits, and retirement. However, as we'll be discussing, many workers see access to fast cash as a critical need for stability in their lives. This isn't a new issue. Many low-income families must resort to payday loans when they're faced with an ex unexpected crisis. Um, but there is a new urgency around this as work becomes more precarious, sometimes driven by technology. The question is, what role can employers, the banking industry, fintech, and workers play in changing this underlying system, and will it be any different? So we'll start tonight's data by giving each presenter a few minutes to talk about their work after I introduce the presenters. So first, we have Rachel Schneider, who is the Omidyar Network Entrepreneur in Residence at the Aspen Institute Financial Security Program and co-author of the Financial Diaries, How American Families Cope in a World of Uncertainty. Rachel's research has been featured in the nation's top publications, including the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and many others. Though she began her career as an investment banker at Merrill Lynch & Company, Rachel credits her commitment to the potential for innovative finance to solve major social problems from her days as a VISTA volunteer, now called AmeriCorps. She holds a JD and MBA from the University of Chicago and a BA from UC Berkeley. Dr. Carmen Rojas is the co-founder and CEO of the Workers Lab, an organization that invests in experiments and innovations to build power for working people in the 21st century. For more than 20 years, Carmen has worked with foundations, financial institutions, and nonprofits to improve the lives of working people across the U.S. Carmen currently sits on the board of the Marguerite Casey Foundation, Neighborhood Funders Group, General Service Foundation, JOLT, Certification Associates, and on the advisory boards of Fund Good Jobs and Floodgate Academy. Carmen holds a PhD in city and regional planning from the University of California, Berkeley. Hey, me too. Uh, not the PhD, but planning. Um, <laughs> and was a full bait Bright Scholar in 2007. Tamara K. Knopper has a PhD in sociology, and her teaching and research focuses on the intersection of economic, racial, and gender inequality, with a particular emphasis on entrepreneurship, banking education, uh, banking globalization, urban development, and money and surveillance. Her publications have examined immigrant entrepreneurship, minority business development, the globalization of ethnic banking, and Asian American communities. Her current work looks at Korean immigrant entrepreneurship in post-civil rights era minority politics. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel, who's gonna start us off. Um, thank you. Um, so thanks everyone for being here. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, so I'm gonna anchor our conversation in a story from the research that I did called the US Financial Diaries. And in that project, I was partnered with a professor at NYU named Jonathan Mordock. And we led a research team where we gathered data from 235 families across the US for a full year. And it was a really intensive project. Essentially, we had field researchers going to meet with families every few weeks to try and understand every single dollar that came in and out of their homes. Every dollar they saved, borrowed, earned, spent, we wanted information about it. And because we were collecting the information in person, we also got to hear the backstory. And so it was a really unusual quantitative and qualitative look at the economic lives of Americans. And the research, we did the research in, three diff in four different locations across the US. Um, and so there was a lot of diversity in the research sample. Um, the key thing, though, is that everyone we were talking with had to be working. That was, at least when we started the year, one of the criterion was that every household that we worked with had to have somebody in it who was working. We were looking at to understand the lives of people who were lower to middle income. So nobody that we talked to was the wealthiest in their neighborhood, but nobody was the poorest either. Um, and so, um, so I'll just tell the story of one family that we met, um, a couple um, named Becky and Jeremy. They live in Ohio, close to um, a major city, but not in a city. And they have three kids. And one of the days that um, 
my co-author Jonathan was out there talking with them, Becky was in a really terrible mood. She was like worried, kind of like distracted. It was a gorgeous day, and Jonathan said, "You know what's going on? Like why? Why are you in such a like? Why are you um, unsettled?" And Becky said, "Well, our mortgage is due in in about three weeks. I have the cash now." I'd really like to pay that bill and be done with that bill. When I know I'm done with that bill, I will feel way easier. Um, and yet she was worried that if she paid that bill now, that in three weeks when it was actually, when her husband got his paycheck, if it was short, if it was a low paycheck, she would have to go borrow money from her sister. And she did not want to borrow money from her sister. And she said, you know, I'm lucky because my sister has a really stable job and she doesn't have kids, so she has extra money and I can rely on her, but I don't want to rely on her. And when I rely on her, then I've got to, like, then I do chores around her house to make up for it. And it changes our relationship in ways I don't want. And what was going on for them was not that they had unstable employment in a technical sense, right? So Jeremy, her husband, works full time. And Becky works part time on the side to make extra money. But what was going on is that even though he works 40 hours a week, week after week, Jeremy's pay goes up and down. And it does that because he fixes long haul trucks. He's a mechanic. And he is supposed to show up for a 40 hour shift over the course of the week, but he gets paid on commission, depending on how many hours, how many trucks actually come in. So in the summer and in the winter, when weather is tougher on trucks, he makes more money. And this was October. And she wasn't sure. Like, are we still, is this still a good month or, or is it becoming a bad month? And so what we learned during this doing the study was that this experience was really typical. So for the most part, we're not relying on slides, but I'm gonna put up one visual, um, Rigo, if you put to the slide, because I feel like it helps to make this point. Um, this is what incomes look like for people, right? So our, our assumption about people's financial lives is that they are steady. If you work, they are steady. But the reality is that what we saw was that very few people had enough months that were average that that idea of steadiness really holds. So on average in our sample, people had five months in the year where income was outside of the plus or minus 25% against their average monthly income, right? So think of it as five times in the month, in the year, their monthly paycheck was either more than 25% over their average or under their average. And when we actually, we use that 25% band up and down bandwidth in order to connect to other research that's been done in the field around volatility year over year which has been going up dramatically over the last three decades. And that's the benchmark researchers have been using. But when we actually look at what kinds of swings we're seeing, they're plus or minus 50% on average. So huge swings up and down. And um, so it kind of throws all your assumptions about budgeting out the window. I usually spend my life in rooms of people who are focused on financial counseling and designing good financial products and making sure people have equal access to credit. And in all of those conversations, the assumption is that we can teach people to budget and then set that budget and move on. And the assumption is that we don't have to worry so much about the small financial decisions. Let's help people make the big ones, right? Let's help people think about retirement. Let's help people think about home ownership. But what this picture shows is that Becky is not thinking about home ownership and retirement. She is thinking about, is next month a good month and can I pay my bills? And that really brings your focus in and makes you think differently about the safety net, I think, in general. So um, how, and, and it makes you think differently, I think, about what kinds of financial products people need. So what does Becky do to handle this? A handful of things, like she's fully banked, right? They have checking accounts and savings accounts. She doesn't really rely on those to manage this volatility. What she does is she stocks her freezer. So when they have a big month, and she stocks her pantry, so she's, she makes a joke, you know, that her freezer is full of pork chops and she will never have to buy toothpaste again. Because when she has a chunk of money and she sees a good deal, she locks that in. And you could think of that as a way of savings, right? Um, and I think that way of savings has a few advantages, right? It's tangible, it helps her sleep at night, she knows the big stuff's taken care of. And she jokes that you can't buy movie tickets with a pork chop, right? You're, you're, you're locked in in advance. Um, but I think what that story is also showing, like what her experience shows us, is the huge gap that exists in financial services today. Like, a savings account is not actually helping her meet her savings objectives. 
Um, and I, I have you know, a whole raft of stories like that about how broken the financial services we deliver to people are. And um, I'm sure we'll get into more of that in the panel. I think it, it connects directly to how we think about workplace benefits, where again, like this, the financial benefits that we tend to give people are ones that help with these big long-term far off goals. There, we don't do as much to help workers with the near-term stuff. And yet the stuff that's keeping them up at night is often that near-term stuff. So I'll stop there. I look forward to the conversation about all this. Yeah. Hi, are you one? <laughs> I can remove this. Oh, no, I want to keep this. Side. He can oh, look at this. The slides and you're not. Um, there are four seats up front, just in case, because I'm a caller outer of the people standing in the back. Um, so please feel free to be really close. You'll get a special prize. Um, I promise you. Um, thank you so much, Data and Society, for this event. I'm really so happy to be here and uh, really thankful to my friendship with Dana. When we started the Workers Lab, I feel like I met Dana and she sort of expanded the universe of what I even imagined was possible for working people by introducing information about technology um, and how the technology was being used at that point for for bad, but also the promise of how it might be used in different ways, right? How to think about social movements. So thank you, uh, and I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I, my name is Carmen Rojas, and I run an organization called The Workers Lab. Uh, we are a lab that invests in innovations and experiments that build power for working people. Um, and really what that means is that we know that in the 20th century, collective bargaining was critical to building a middle class in this country and we've just seen a rapid decline of the ability of workers to organize. So we've been charged with trying to find all of the other ways that we can make workers, working people's lives better. Uh, we do this in a couple of ways. So we have an innovation fund that we run twice a year uh, and give a whole host of people, uh, it's a broad range of folks, $150,000 for 12 months just to try something new. So. Our last innovation fund winners include a cannabis um, accelerator program in Oakland that's trying to get previously incarcerated folks to understand what the labor implications are for the cannabis economy um, to sort of more traditional co-ops. Um, and we landed in this field of work almost by uh, accident at a meeting that I was at a, about a year ago uh, and a year ago, there was a really rich conversation that was happening about the rise of gig work and Uber taking over the streets and changing the economy. Um, and in that conversation was a kernel of, uh, of thought that we needed to actually rethink the benefit structures for working people, and we needed a portable benefit. So it was gig workers and portable benefits. Um, and the things that I left a couple of meetings feeling were, on the one side, the conversations were often organized, like we need 1099 contractors to be W-2 workers. And the assumption there was that if you worked at McDonald's as a low wage worker, your life was exponentially better than if you drove for Uber. And what we kept on seeing in the numbers was that they were equally as poor. Um, and that the set of benefits and uh, protections that were afforded to them legally were often impossible for them to use. So one was that. The second was in the portable benefits conversation specifically, it was like we were solving uh, a, 21st century, uh, a 21st century problem with 20th century tools. So the only things people could imagine were things that you can plan like healthcare or these long-term things like retirement. And so, I met Rachel, read the financial diaries, and I was like, how come nobody in the world of work is actually thinking about how to meet these short-term financial needs? How to meet the short-term financial needs? Why is the only option borrowing from your sister or at its best, or payday lending at its worst? And why aren't worker organizations entering more fully into a conversation about the range of financial needs that working people have? So about a year ago, I read the book, was like, yes, we need to figure this out. And we were a doer organization. So we started a design sprint. Um, and 
the whole focus was to try to answer three questions. So if we were working to get working people $1,000 when they needed it, who pays? Because as Rachel was saying, a lot of the burden in the current system is placed on working people. So they're like, save a quarter every two weeks, and then in five years when you have a financial emergency, you'll have $500. But that just seems absurd. We believe that either contract companies or employers should be paying it, and we wanted to create a precedent for that. The second question was how much? I feel like we landed on the $1,000 problem almost because it sounds really, it's like quippy. Um, but we knew that the, uh, it could go as high as $2,500 and as low as $400, but we didn't actually have a bunch of information about that. And then the last thing is, what did, how do we get this money to workers with the least amount of friction, right? So right now, working people have to bear the greatest burden to get this money. We convened a group of people that include Rachel, uh, a group called Commonwealth that actually builds financial products, David Weil, who worked for President Obama and set like wage and hour policy and wrote The Fissured Workplace. And we set on this journey to actually build something to get working people $1,000 when they need it. So we started, we did explorations, understood the landscape, and reached the point, I would say, that in the last couple of weeks where we started doing a pilot and a pre-pilot uh, for the product where as a, well, I'm, I'm gonna say this, but then Rachel can say, no, no, that's not true. <laughs> this is a good thing about being on a panel together. I feel like I had the insight about a week, a week or two ago where we were thinking about this as a problem that could be solved by the market, right? So we were talking to the largest gig companies and we're like, well, would you pay into this thing so that your, your drivers or your cleaners or your delivery people would have $1,000 when they needed it? And the, overwhelmingly, there was no, we never had anybody say no. Uh, and we're at the point where people wanting, wanted to say yes. And uh, we were really excited. I was like, this is amazing. People actually really want to, why has this been so difficult? How come nobody's ever asked them this before? And when we started making this announcement about the design sprint, we also had a number of W-2 employers and associations of W-2 employers approach us and say, hey, our workers have this issue too. Can you include W-2 workers into this design sprint? The insight for me came at the moment where we started actually scratching the surface of where the money was gonna come from in the companies. Um, and, that wasn't, uh, and that wasn't a part of the, that was, our question was who pays and it wasn't how do they pay, right? So I just wanna set that out there. We're still in the who pays. Um, but more and more we started seeing companies that were interested in using charitable dollars to pay this $1,000. So uh, a company doesn't pay their workers enough, <laughs> they don't have $1,000 to solve this issue, uses their philanthropic arm to cover this, and then gets like the double bonus, right? They get the bonus of saying, hey, we're helping our workers solve this problem, but then they get the tax bonus of actually using charitable dollars to meet a, like a structural problem built into the institution. So I feel like personally I've made this very, uh, it's like insight, right? Like when you're in a research process, the insight for me is that this is no longer a financial product problem. This is a social policy problem, that our current social safety net has left a huge uh, issue confronting working people on the table and has left it to the most predatory people in the market to try to address. And are now, I feel like, in this point in our design point where we're still gonna go through, get people $1,000, see what we learned, but we understand that there has to be a government mandate, that, that government fundamentally needs to play a role in both protecting workers so that their only options aren't predatory, but also in actually making sure that they get this money when they need it. Um, so I'll leave it at that. So first of all, my name is Tamara, and I want to thank um, IHA for inviting me to be part of this presentation as well as CJ and Beth for their work on this, as well as the other uh, data and society staff and volunteers. Um, this is my second time here and I really enjoy this space. And also it's very nice to be in conversation with Rachel and with Carmen. <clears throat> I took a train today from Providence and I'm about to leave right after this and go back. But to me, you travel and you kind of do the work to be part of conversations you wanna be part of. So I'm very grateful to be part of this. Uh, so one thing is, is that, um, as I have mentioned, a lot of my work has looked at kind of ethnic banking and globalization and banking. 
Um, and so in that process, I looked at how banks kind of dealt with immigrants and how the US federal government dealt with immigrants. And so I'm starting to transition into thinking about things like credit scoring and risk assessment and what that means for kind of um, uh, the racial wealth gap. <clears throat> so one thing is, uh, today when we were on the train, we got the text alert from President Trump. Did everybody else get their text alert, right? Um, and the man next to me didn't get his. He looked a little sad, but um, I'm sure it's coming, as I told him, right? But one thing is, I don't know if you saw recently that President Trump's administration is considering using credit scores for immigrants, right? Um, and so this is something where uh, the concern is of immigrants becoming what they call a quote unquote public charge. And this is something that has been part of immigration policy since the 1800s. Uh, the concern that immigrants will be a kind of financial burden or a drain on the system. So if we think about some of the immigration policies that have targeted immigrants regarding welfare use, right? That's been kind of part of that um, uh, trajectory. And so this is, raises an interesting question, um, given that about four and a half billion globally are either unbanked or don't have kind of a credit standing. So unbanked means usually that you don't have kind of a formal relationship with a bank in terms of a, a checking or savings account. So when people are talking about kind of alternative banking like payday loans and so forth, um, and trying to find kind of access to quick money, um, this is some of the uh, realities of being unbanked. And so one of the things that I've been thinking about is about the politics of being unbanked and about the effort to bank unbanked people, right? Um, and this is something that increasingly uh, big banks have been doing. So I don't know if you heard some of the controversy uh, about a month ago where Bank of America, one of the largest banks in the US, um, was sending out requests for people's citizenship status, right? And this was happening to both people who were immigrants, but also people who were US citizens. And they were asking people to verify their citizenship status. So you had all these journalists uh, you know, kind of asking questions and asking uh, bankers associations in cities, is this necessary? Um, the Department of Treasury does not require banks to collect citizenship status data, right? And so this is something that the banks themselves are doing. Um, and Bank of America said, oh, we've been doing this for a while and so forth. And one of the things that kind of struck me about it, since I had studied uh, some of the ways banks try to kind of target immigrants, is that Bank of America, if you don't know, like years ago, was very aggressive in trying to target undocumented immigrants as customers, right? And in particular, undocumented Latino immigrants. And so um, this is where, if we think about alternative forms of data identification, um, such as a counselor card from another country, um, Bank of America, you know, you have op-eds in newspapers where Bank of America officials are defending their use of it. They were being dragged on Fox News and other, you know, um, uh, news sources for helping, quote unquote, you know, undocumented immigrants get ahead. There was all these concerns about would this lead to kind of increased terrorism and so forth. And Bank of America was an institution that very aggressively defended, right? And they used this language of helping the unbanked, of trying to do good, right? Um, so when you're talking about the ways they can kind of pose, you know, these institutions can pose themselves, right, as doing a social good. But there was a lot of questions about was this an effort, obviously, to make money? And Bank of America was also trying to change some of its business habits because it had been losing money, right? And so um, this is stuff where I'm thinking a lot about what does it mean to try to bank the unbanked? Because that becomes kind of, um, a dominant kind of alternative that's often posed, and it's posed by um, everyone from financial institutions to sometimes community advocacy groups to immigrant rights groups and so forth. And on one hand, we know the realities of what it means to be unbanked in terms of some of the stuff that you um, have uncovered in your research and working with the constituencies you have um, in terms of payday lenders, right? Um, people being charged exorbitant interest rates and so forth. But one of the things that I'm, I've been thinking about, and there's two scholars that, if you haven't heard of them, I want to put on your radar, or three scholars um, who've written a couple articles. One is, <clears throat> 
One is Rob Aiken, and he's a political scientist. And he has this very controversial title um, of an article called All Data is Credit Data. And he's thinking about um, precariousness. And he says, you know, a lot of times we think about uh, financial precariousness as being excluded. But what are the predatory ways that people become, you know, their lives are economically precarious through inclusion, right? And then um, there are two sociologists. Well, I think one is a sociologist. I'm not sure if the other one would claim that, but we'll claim him as a sociologist. Uh, Louise Seamster and Raphael Chiron Chenier, and they have a concept called predatory inclusion. And this is a concept that they've had in a couple of sociological articles. And they're talking about, um, they talk about, for example, um, uh, black recipients of education loans and how the, um, a lot of times the terms of the, those loans are much more predatory, but how people use kind of the um, discourse of inclusion, um, they play up on people being marginalized, being wanting to have access, right, and having been systematically denied access. And so they use this term, I'm sorry, this is where, okay, here we go. They say predatory inclusion refers to a process whereby members of a marginalized group are provided with access to a good service or opportunity from which they have historically been excluded, but under conditions that jeopardize the benefits of access. Indeed, processes of predatory inclusion are often presented as providing marginalized individuals with opportunities for social and economic progress. In the long term, however, predatory inclusion reproduces inequality and insecurity for some, while allowing already dominant social actors to derive significant profits, right? And so this is something where I'm thinking about kind of this double-edged sword. On one hand, people need access to financial institutions. They need access to um, better financial products, ones that think about their lives, right? On the other hand, it also means that you're kind of being brought into a system of kind of governmentality, big data collection, right? And where, and this is something I talked about in the Future Perfect event I was at in the summer here, um, it becomes where a whole range of activities become data towards your quote unquote character. If risk assessment a lot of times is assumptions about character, about risk, who can be trusted and so forth. And so this is something where um, when we think about uh, some of the efforts to kind of bank the unbanked, right, whether it's Bank of America kind of targeting people um, for um, and using kind of alternative forms of identification, a lot of those loans that they targeted undocumented immigrants with, um, that in had very high interest rates, right? And so this is where sometimes kind of I think there's a blurred line. I mean, they're not as high of interest rates as payday lenders, let's say, but they're very high interest rates. And so sometimes the lines begin to blur between kind of banking practices and alternative banking practices, right? Um, but it also becomes a question about kind of big data collection. So Bank of America was asked, for example, will you turn over this data to the government? And they were like, oh, we would never do that, da, 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 right? But this is data that they're collecting just by virtue of kind of targeting the undocumented folks, right? There's a certain way where they know a certain amount of them are undocumented just by the documents that they're having them give as alternative forms of documentation. But also on top of that, to have you fill out a form saying, are you a citizen or not, right? Means that that becomes even more data on a wider group of people, including US citizens. And so it means that these financial institutions are collecting so much information about our lives that can also be issues around security breaches, um, if they are asked to report that data, and also how does that data become part of internal banking decisions, right? Um, and so this is something where I'm thinking about uh, one of the things that um, uh, Rob Aiken says about how the unbanked themselves is its own profile that there's this idea that the unbanked are quote unquote unknown and that they have to kind of be brought into kind of banking, right? Um, and we have similar discourses around immigration, this idea of like out of the shadows, right? And kind of be brought into um, visibility. But there's this way where um, one of the things he's suggesting is that to be already identified as unbanked or unbankable um, is to already be sorted in a kind of a certain category in which you're already kind of being 
um, pushed into kind of certain segmentation or into terms of certain products. So one of the things I show my students, um, a lot of my students don't know that this is the 10th year anniversary of the financial crisis, right? And we're seeing a lot of kind of think pieces about what we've learned from that. So they don't know what subprime mortgages are. And so one of the things we've learned about in my sociology classes is redlining, about people being systematically discriminated. But I talk to them about predatory lending so they get kind of an understanding of what are we dealing with in terms of the contemporary racial wealth gap and subprime mortgages. And I show them this story about Wells Fargo where Beth Jacobson, who is one of the people who testified about their subprime mortgage lending, she said that you know, mortgage lenders would describe black people as quote unquote mud people. Right? And they had described certain loans as ghetto loans. And these are direct quotes from these news stories, right? And so there's a way where there's, you know, what I think Aiken is doing is he's helping me think through the way in which I've been thinking through unbankedness. I've been thinking through unbankedness as you're unbanked, now they're gonna have more alternative data on you, and now you know this could be a problem. I think that's still the case. But he's actually saying to even be kind of categorized as unbanked itself means that you're kind of already being pushed into kind of certain segmentation. Oh, have people not been able to hear me? Okay, I was like, because they gave us the whole thing about getting this close, but you, I'm sorry, like that's, okay. So I apologize, okay. Okay, okay, yeah, so um, it's both a mic check and a time check. Okay, so anyway, so, but this is the thing about kind of um, thinking through unbankedness as itself its own kind of category of, of calculation, right? So, all right, thank you. All right, well, thank you so much, all three of you, for dropping so much knowledge right there. <laughs> um, I wanted to, to start by asking, you know, it seems to me that to some extent, the current situation facing workers is a call for a change in workplace benefits. Um, but it could also be seen as a call for demanding that employers uh, do better, right? One is pay more, but also maybe pay on time, um, pay more frequently. And I'm reminded um, of a story I recently read about a journalist who was outraged to learn that um, because the paper that he had written for didn't pay him in time, he could use this program called Fast Forward or, or it's work, work World, Work Market, to get paid what he was owed for a fee. So his, his, his company hadn't paid for him, but now he could get his money, but he'd have to pay for it because it wasn't on time. So um, I'm kind of wondering, how do you feel about either of those situations? And what, what do you think were really, which, which is actually more of the truth? Yeah, either. Oh, which is more of the truth? Or, well, how do you see it? Um, all right, I, Maybe we, it's not neither. Well, um, so, I, so this makes me think of some of the points that both of the brilliant women sitting next to me made. Um, on the one hand, um, th that kind of service is trying to replicate the benefit of being an employee. Like in theory, one of the benefits of being an employee is that there are rules around how often you have to get paid. And if your employer does not pay you according to the time period set by legislation, in theory, you can go and lodge a complaint somewhere and there should be an enforcement action. Now, as Carmen points out, like the reality of that is um, imperfect to say the least, right? And so wage theft is a real issue for low wage workers of in all sorts of industries. So in theory, so, and the reason that makes me think of um, uh, what Tamara was saying is that um, the reality often doesn't match the objective, right? So the objective in that product is to be able to enable people to be paid faster. That is allegedly, that's the goal, right? And in fact, if you're a contractor and you're not being paid quickly, like that's an important need that you have to fulfill. But in this case, that what they're doing is then charging the worker a pretty massive transaction fee. And so the product itself sucks, unequivocally sucks. Um, and so um, where you're, what you're left with is an attempt to use the market to solve a problem that's being really left um, to individuals to work through, when actually it's a problem that deserves regulation and enforcement, as well as innovation. Because there is something useful for, in contracting relationships, there is something useful to having um, a contractor and a payer, a, a, you know, a buyer of those services, and having somebody else who manages the payment in between. Like that may be a good market solution. But we do need regulation then around 
um, fees so that the person who has the least power in this situation doesn't get screwed, which is what's happening in the story that you shared, right? Um, where the worker is the one paying the fee, and it's a big fee. And so that seems wrong. Um, is that's the person with the least power, the least economic cushion to with which to absorb the fee. And you're essentially like um, shifting a whole bunch of the costs of having work get done onto the worker, mm -hmm. um, right? The cost of paying somebody, the cost of managing accounts receivable. It's not, there's no argument for why the worker should bear that. And I would say Jeremy in the story I'm telling is the exact same thing, right? What's happening in his situation is that his workplace is passing on the risk of ups and downs and demands for their services to him. Mm -hmm. And so I'd say like, we are who so it really to me becomes a question of who is best able to bear risk you want to spread risk across groups right that's the underlying idea of insurance in all forms is that you want to spread a risk across a lots of people so that it doesn't hit anybody hard but what you're seeing in the labor market is increasingly shifts of work of the shift of risks that are really if supposed to be borne by corporations that's the purpose of creating corporations um, and those risks are being shifted to individual workers. And, and before I, before you speak, Carmen, I just wanted to mention a lot of the companies that are filling this space are what are called fintech companies. So it, it's, it's, it may not yet be part of traditional banking, although it seems like they're acquiring some of them, but it's, it's this different category. I also think that there's a really funny position that I, I find myself in, right? Like we're the workers lab, we're focused on worker issues. We are mostly talking about wages and earnings. And one of the things that this project and, and Rachel's work specifically has brought to light is that people need all different kinds of money, right? Like you need access to debt to buy a house or to buy a car unless you have all that money up front. And like even rich people use debt. I mean, one of the things that we've, <laughs> we've learned in the last couple of days is how Donald Trump's dad has moved money over time uh, and increased, like has created different vehicles for moving money to solve specific problems. From the worker organization perspective, solving for wages helps to solve one thing, but it doesn't help to solve it for the whole host of other issues that working people need money for. I do agree, like we can increase wages infinite so that people can save enough money over five years to buy a house outright and then make invisible the debt market or debt as a, as a vehicle. Or, yes and, <laughs> today people need debt for things and people have emergency expenses. And we should be trying to figure out what the map or uh, the tapestry of financial needs that working people have above and beyond meeting their needs through wages and actually start to build uh, and understand a safety net that can actually respond to the range of those needs. Did you, did you want to answer, Tamara? Well, you know, when you're talking, I was thinking about... Um, so I used to be involved in immigrant rights activism, and so actually... <laughs> Like when you're talking about LA, I was thinking about um, like I used to. I went to an immigrant rights training. We were like protesting the guy who ran Forever 21, right? So we're outside the store and we're chanting his name and everything, right? And I was thinking about just like how a lot of times, um, while you guys were while you both were talking, um, how a lot of times we kind of focus on companies as like the employer in terms of like the employer who's not paying the fair amount of wages or the employer. So I'm thinking about you know some of these campaigns I was a part of or that we supported or that we were familiar with in immigrant rights work um, where they're kind of holding the employer accountable for the wages. But I was thinking about, you know, is it better, and I'm not saying like I came up with this idea, but is it better sometimes for us to think about the company itself in terms of like how are they impacting society overall? So both in terms of wages but if we think about like Jeff Bezos, right? And so we heard about how Amazon is now gonna pay $15 an hour. And there's all this debate about, you know, is this kind of a, a slick move on his part? Did Bernie Sanders push? I mean, there's, you know, there's a whole bunch of Twitter talk about it, okay? But the thing is, you know, we know that Amazon has all these problems in terms of their taxes, yeah. right? And so this is what I mean about thinking about the difference between targeting an employer and thinking about the employer only in terms of wages, but thinking about the company overall and what is the company doing to society, both in terms of wages, and this gets into stuff around like environmental, um, where do they lobby, right? Who, um, uh, what taxes do they have? Because if we're thinking about a social safety net, it's also about you know, what tax money we have and then also how do we use it, right? 
Um, so if we think about like Walmart, um, I remember one time like MSNBC, they're trying to you know make a point, and I don't think like the idea of a welfare queen can be rehabilitated. I just think that's a terrible you know kind of image. But they're trying to say that Walmart was the biggest quote unquote welfare queen, and their point, even though they used like a you know a terrible uh, analogy there. They were trying to say, because so many Walmart workers are paid so low, a lot of Walmart workers are required to get um, public assistance, and that this is a way of thinking about how Walmart impacts the society overall, right, as a company. And so I think um, there's ways of thinking about how we target an employer for specific campaigns around wages, around specific work conditions, but I think when we're thinking about a company's role in the overall society, it can be helpful to think on multiple levels, if that makes sense. Definitely, that does. Um, and so to that, to that point of you know, the role of different parts of, of different institutions, do you think that since this is data and society, I have to bring the tech back into it, um, so some companies like Uber do allow like instant pay or people getting paid right away, right when they need their money. And on the opposite extreme, you have federal employees which are paid once a month. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems like being paid right away is a good thing and there, there are new tech and fi financial institutions that are offering this. Um, what role should they play in the future of work as work becomes more precarious, as hours fluctuate, as people work in multiple jobs? I mean you know, waiting um, waiting a month to get paid for your primary job and then getting paid every two weeks for another job might, might be, be a good thing. Um, and then, you know, what role do you think they would play and what would you suggest that can be, that can be done differently so that we're not sort of replicating what you suggested, which is another predatory program, just calling it FinTech? I, I, I'm starting again. Uh, I, I'm starting again, everybody. We're just, we have a, we have an, it's a habit now. But so the next time I'm not starting. Um, so um, the idea of being paid biweekly or monthly is arbitrary and not consistent with today's anything, right? Like what else do you have? Like right? It, it's it's sort of on its face odd, in the sense that you don't um, like why that why those time periods. Exactly, right? So the background, like the historical precedent, like the historical reasons make sense, right? At some point, it cost money to sound out checks and companies didn't want to do that every day, so they picked a cadence on which to send out checks. Then there were issues about employees not being paid, so um, protections were put in to make sure you were paid often enough. Mm -hmm. But now, like it's not expensive to pay people because you're running it over electronic rails, you're not sending out paper checks by mail. And so in that context, the idea of getting a bi-monthly payment is arbitrary. And what we've seen in people's financial lives is that they have this incredible volatility and they need to be able to access money um, often more immediately than waiting for two weeks. So in that context, like giving people access to money they've earned more quickly just seems to me um, kind of an obvious direction that our society would go given how technology has changed the speed of everything else, right? Um, like everything else has gotten faster, why not your paycheck? is sort of how I think of it. On the other hand, what you see is that um, it is very hard for people not to spend the money that they have. And be behavioral economists in particular, I had a big fight about these um, payment vehicles once with a behavioral economist who was arguing that actually forcing people to wait two weeks for their money is an important way of helping them to manage their spending. And in fact, what you see on the platforms like Uber is that people drive more when they need cash and that instant payment is a powerful incentive to work more. And that seems problematic to me in a different direction, right? Because um, we don't actually want people to have to work all the time. And we do, people do need, as you saw, like as I told the story of Becky, like people need help budgeting. It's not easy. It's not, it's, it's a hard work as a human to delay gratification of the future, especially if you're living at the edge of your spending ability because you don't make enough for what a normal life in America costs. Um, so I think it's actually a little complicated. Like on the one hand, of course, you should get people access to their money. On the other hand, you want to design financial services that enable people to live their best lives. Mm -hmm. And so I actually think in this case, what Walmart did is, is, I don't know if it's quite a best practice. I don't know if we know enough to say it's a best practice, but I think it's in the right direction. What they did is they instituted a, um, a FinTech solution where you as a Walmart worker can get access to your money in between paychecks. 
Um, but you can only do it, and Walmart pays for that service, so they're not passing that fee on to their workers. You can only do it a certain number of times a year. Mm -hmm. If you want to do it more than that, you start paying for it yourself. So there's some disincentive to do it. And I, th like, I think that's, that's directionally right. Um, is it, will it turn out to be exactly right for workers? I don't, I don't know. But to me, it, what it does is it honors the reality of today's financial lives and how quickly other things in life move. Um, it puts a lot of control in the hands of the individual who is going to actually use their money to pay their bills and should get some choice about when they get that money, therefore. But at the same time, it, r it recognizes that people make, have a hard time making good financial choices and um, should be like, given some boundaries within which to not screw up too badly. So that's my take. Go on to your next question, Dave. Oh, you answer? Answer? No, I feel like that was a good, was a good answer. Okay. You're in agreement. You're in agreement with Rachel. Okay, did you? Did you? I'm going I'm to upset the, the order. Well, already, I know. well uh, part of it is I'm thinking about, you know, so I am doing some work on fintech companies that, um, like, are online lenders, right? And this is increasingly um, changing kind of the banking landscape. Um, and some of them are doing things like tracking your social media and using alternative data and so forth. Um, and one thing that when we had a conference call with all four of us, as well as CJ, um, Rachel said something I thought was really interesting about kind of, well, the way we think about fintech, right? There's actually a lot of fintech, and it's not just these kind of online lenders. So what you were saying about Walmart, that'd yeah. be an example of fintech. And I think one thing is that when we think about kind of, um, the way that you're talking about kind of work today, it's also increasingly a conversation about kind of your access to certain technology and your relationship to it. So when you're talking about kind of certain ways that people can get paid quickly, right? Usually it means having um, a relationship to certain institutions, but also having a relationship to like a smartphone or something. I mean, you know what I mean? Um, and so there's stuff about um, the role of kind of certain technology becoming much more instrumental in just getting paid um, part of the reason why payday lending actually emerges to the degree it does in like the 1990s where it like really explodes as an industry is because some people have argued is because of the rise of like direct deposit, right? Which would be a form of financial technology, right? And that more people and that um, payday lenders were trying to go after more checks because they were just getting less checks. So they became kind of more aggressive and kind of, and so forth and trying to get a market and everything. So there's all these ways that like, I think technology is shaping, you know, both work and we're, you're thinking about that here with the stuff with Uber, but also it's shaping how we get paid and how quickly we get paid and the way we also maybe think about our bosses and our, and the companies in terms of, you know, I would probably like my boss if I thought I could get paid quicker, like with Walmart, even if Walmart's paying me so badly, right? And so there's also a way, like, how does kind of quick payment through technology also sometimes stunt maybe a more critical view of kind of the employer, right? And, and of like the wages and why, like, I need that money so quickly in the first place. So anyways, okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, I just don't like Walmart also, by the way. So. <laughs> uh, I think some, a bunch of us would agree. Um, so we're actually, we're, we're over time, so we wanted to give some minutes to the uh, audience to ask a couple questions. Does anyone have a question? Can you run the mic around? Just to say your name. Yeah, I'm, <coughs> excuse me. I'm Eva Jesperson. Um, I am, for many of the points that you were making, it would, and you know, clearly reflective of a very tight sort of scenario for uh, social protection. But I wonder, there is a lot of discussion now about basic social income, mm -hmm. the idea that people would get a small stipend that would bridge them in the situation that Carmen was uh, suggesting, or Rachel. Um, and I wonder if you would reflect on the feasibility and even the advocacy for a scheme like that. I feel like this is directly for Carmen, but I, I have a response, but if, if you want. I think Carmen should write a like yeah. it. It's like a strong opinion. It's gonna be more fun. I think it's the political context, right? So like if we end the story of the design sprint today and the need for social policy, part of it is in response to our current political climate where um, 
uh, frankly, like our social safety net meets very little of the needs of working people, of poor people, of middle class. It only meets the needs of rich people today, just fundamentally. Uh, my concern is that we introduce something like UBI in this political context. There are two things that are red flags for me. So. Uh, for people in the world of technology who are paying for UBI experiments, I, um, I want to see an equal amount of money go into tax reform. Um, and so that's the, like a singular, like I want a one to one, I actually want a two to one, um, just because that's what it's going to cost. And until I see that signal out into the world, then I just think that this is, uh, I just don't buy it. I don't. Uh, I'm not like a feasible person, but this is probably the, my 2018 use of the word feasible. <laughs> feasible. I can't imagine that it's feasible. My second concern is a particularly US uh, conservative concern is that I actually don't have evidence that if we started doing, giving everybody a universal basic income, that conservatives in this country wouldn't continue to hollow away the functions of the public good and say to us all, here's your $1,000, choose a private school you're gonna send your kids to. Here's your $2,000, choose what street's gonna get a light. You pay for, I mean, Colorado, where you have <laughs> parts of the state of Colorado where people have to pay for their street lights or libraries individually. I feel like that further sort of atrophies the ability of government to provide good. In other contexts, I'm not sure, but I worry about the specific political context of the United States, what it invites and whether or not we've like thoroughly grappled with those things before introducing uh, these experiments. So I, I agree with everything Carmen said, and I would also say I'm more UBI curious than yeah. Carmen is, yeah. in the sense that, like, it, like that, right, she is right. Like, it, it's dangerous politically for us as a country to consider. Like, we're not in a place where you could introduce a UBI and not risk giving up a massive amount in other social supports for people. But the reason I remain curious about it is that I think that Philosophically, as a, society, as a society, as wealthy as we are, we should have a more robust conversation around the minimum standard of living that we are gonna guarantee to anybody on our shores. Anybody on, and, and the minimum um, quality of life that we think that you should have if you live here. And, and I also think, and so I think UBI in some circles has been a foil for that conversation. And I also think mm -hmm. that um, it is, in some places, a useful way to talk about redistribution, which should be far more on the table than it is. So I have zero interest in UBI when people talk about it in the future of work, technology's coming, automation's gonna get rid of jobs, let's give people a UBI. That is useless, I think, as a way of understanding the world. But if you're gonna think about it as a whole bunch of people have gotten extremely wealthy as a result of choices we have made about policy, and now let's make sure we also make choices in the policy realm to enable that wealth to be shared across society better, then I'm in, right? Um, it just, it's very hard to make sure the conversation stays in that lane. And I think as a practical matter, the politics are exactly what Carmen says. All right. So it's interesting you asked that question because it was actually going to be a question I was going to ask to the panel, primarily because I see what Carmen is proposing as uh, u universal basic income stability for the near future. This is, this is the instability of work right now, is the fact that people don't have $400 to deal with a crisis right now. This is a much more practical uh, solution to future of work because we know what's happening in the future of work. Work is becoming more casualized. It's becoming, you know, these these huge fluctuations in in earnings. So I I actually think Carmen, you have the solution <laughs> right in your hand. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Hi. Um, I sort of have a question about um, something Tamara mentioned about alternative credit data and how sort of a whole wide range of activity is being coming used uh, towards assessing people's character. And that puts a lot of emphasis on choice and the kinds of financial choices uh, people make and the fact that like sometimes, as Rachel 
uh, earlier mentioned that you know a lot of the dis financial dis decisions that people make are very difficult, and it makes me sort of think of uh, think like choices that may seem irrational on the surface, but are actually rational in some ways uh, for people on the ground. So like I forget who does who uh, did this research, but. Um, looking at how uh, why people choose payday loans uh, even when they have access to credit card lines and the reason why they choose them is because they know that payday loan delinquency isn't going to ruin their credit uh, in the same way that credit card debt will. So I'm sort of interested in how the like increasingly granular scrutiny and the, the very strong moralizing uh, um, cultural like uh, weight that we place on people's financial decisions and their relationship to debt is going to become incredibly complicated by uh, all of this data that is being collected about people and their financial decisions. Uh, thank you. Um, sorry, you're behind a pole, so I was. Uh, uh, hello. Thank you. I was like, okay. Um, so um, one thing is is that uh, I think the data, unlike unbanked people, it does show that people make much more calculated decisions about why they use sometimes alternative lenders. <clears throat> so there's like a, um, I was looking at a book the other day by, I forget the gentleman, he's at Russell Sage, or it was published by Russell Sage about why people use payday lenders. And some of it shows that some of them have access to bank accounts, but they want the money quicker, even though they could wait a couple days. So sometimes people do want the money quicker. Um, some of it's for the reasons you say. Some people just don't want to have a bank account for whatever reason. Um, but I think um, the thing with alternative data, the issue it becomes that it's seen as this um, solution to how traditional credit scoring has been done. And so you have all these people that are considered credit invisible or unscored. And so, um, and you have legislatures, uh, legislators both um, Republicans and Democrats who are pushing for this alternative data as kind of a response to um, people not lacking credit. So it does mean that more um, of your data could be collected and it also creates, if we think about kind of the role of FinTech, right? It creates this incentive for companies to also kind of um, figure out a way to do that. So there's like, um, I forget what the name of it is, but there's a database like Vantage Score, which looks at your rental history, and it also looks at your, um, uh, it looks at rental history, it looks at like um, utility payments and so forth, right? So things that a lot of times, if you're struggling to make ends meet, you might, um, you know, pay your rent late and hope that your landlord, right, kind of understands it, or you might take the um, penalty fee, right? Um, one of the things that I've been thinking about and that I'm trying to sort through more in my own thinking, and when I was saying that some of the stuff regarding kind of the banked, the, the banking practices and the alternative banking practices kind of um, colliding, is that in immigrant entrepreneurship, I did a lot of research looking at Korean banks, and they focused on this thing called relationship lending. And relationship lending is very big with like kind of immigrant-based banks, because it's the idea that you know, some of their applicants might not have extensive credit histories, even though they might have the money, right? So there's things like they might not have certain things that would make them good on paper, or they don't own a lot of property here in the US in terms of collateral. So a lot of these immigrant banks have been accepting forms of data that we today might consider alternative data within certain markets, but they're looking at people's rental histories in other countries, they're looking at, um, uh, your payment histories in other countries, right? And so that's where some of the kind of um, banking practices collide with also like this alternative data stuff. And it's actually kind of using some of that, right? Part of it is um, it becomes this question about how much of our economic activity becomes tracked and becomes a, a sign of our so-called character. So one of the concepts I'm developing is about digital character, right? This idea of kind of having a digital footprint and all of your activities that can be digitally tracked becoming part of your kind of character profile in terms of how people do risk assessment. And when, uh, you know, uh, this uh, professor of political science, Aiken, as I've been quoting him, when he's talking about all credit, all data becomes kind of credit data, right? It's also kind of what do we decide to start calculating or scoring or keeping track of? So you could have any activity start to become kind of financial activity according to some of these models, right? And that's part of also 
plays is the role of technology in giving us the opportunity to track this stuff, right? It also becomes part of this problem. So. Oh, sure. Yeah, thank you. So, um, so um, and I'll be succinct because I know you want to wrap up. Um, an important way to think about this is that um, your data is going to be used to make financial decisions about you. That is just already the fact, right? So before there's an alt a debate about alternative data, there's already the fact that credit scores exist and our credit scores are actively used in job applications, applications for rental, for apartments, of course any application to credit, but also ability to get insurance. So your credit score is already going to be used in every facet of your life. That is just the fact of reality already today. So you have to take that as the baseline. And then this addition of alternative data makes it more complicated because it both brings in some new people who were going to be um, cut out of credit access because they didn't have good credit scores, but the alternative data brings them in. And the research shows that a significant number of people, when you use alternative credit data sources, they all of a sudden look like better credit risks than they did before. And they get access to credit that they otherwise weren't going to get. But at the same time, it does affect behavior, and it does mean that there's more of people's lives that are being tracked, and it does mean that there's, um, um, so it, it's hard, right? It's not, it's not obvious. And so the point I wanted to make about it is that it's like any of our other conversations about data. The issue is how does the data get used? That's always gonna be the issue. At the end of the day, data is just one input into a human decision-making process. That decision-making process has a certain amount of automation and a certain amount of people making decisions, right? And in credit, it's very stark because on one end, relationship lending is people making decisions based on data, and at the other end is totally automated lending, like when you apply for a credit card, standing in the line at, a, at, at, the, at the counter at J.Crew, right? 100% automated. Either way, what's happening is that some person has made a decision-making rubric using data. And so that, in some ways, like this is just a microcosm of all the other conversations we have around like what is the role of humans in making sure that we use th those data sources to develop good decision-making processes that get people good amounts of credit, not too much credit, um, but don't leave people out for the wrong reasons, right? So we have a long history of leading people out of credit for, um, because of racial profiling. That's, right? So but it's, it's never intrinsically about the data, is my point of view, never. It is always about how you use the data and what choices you make about who owns the data and who has rights to the data and whether or not the data is protected and how the data is then incorporated into a, a decision-making process that is ultimately designed by a person. Well, uh, we are over time, so one more round of applause for our speakers, please. <laughs> thank, you, thank you, everyone.